The great French gastronome Briat Savarin once said, Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you what you are. I'm Jamie Schler. Welcome to Stir Crazy, where I'll be talking food with the most intriguing people who you least expect to talk about food. My guest today started his journalism career on local TV and radio in Denver and San Francisco, but he's best known as a former anchor and longtime foreign correspondent for CNN International, reporting from such places as Beirut, Frankfurt, Rome, and London for more than 30 years. He covered the Gulf War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the downfall of Saddam Hussein. He formerly hosted several CNN news reports, including The World Today, The Brief, Inside Africa, and CNN Connects before leaving the network. He's won several prestigious awards, including the George Polk Award for reporting on the genocide in Rwanda, the DuPont Columbia Award for coverage of the war in Bosnia, an Emmy for reporting on famine in Somalia, the A.H. Borma Award from the UN Food and Agriculture Culture Organization for coverage of global food and hunger issues, which we will be talking about today. And I am very honored to have my friend Jim Clancy on Stir Crazy today. Hi, Jim. So it's so nice to cook with you today. I've lived in Europe for a gazillion years, and so CNN International was my go-to Anglophone TV station. So I've known who you are for years. I've watched you on TV. But we connected on Twitter more than a year ago, I guess. And then we got to be friends over Madeleine. I can't remember how we connected exactly, but I know when I started posting recipes on Twitter a year ago at the beginning of confinement, I sent you the link to one I had posted and said, why don't you try this? And you said, I'm not trying anything new until I figure out Madeleine. And that's how we got to be friends. <laughs> Well, yeah, and your recipe had a little pinch of cardamom in it, so you won me over straight away. <laughs> Did you make it with saffron once? Oh, no, you uh, have it with saffron tea, don't you? There's something yeah, with saffron in there. I have it with coffee every morning. So, oh, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those spices that adds a little warmth to things, and, you know, I found that I really like it, and uh, your recipe had it in it. I tried the New York Times. I wasn't satisfied with that. I got yours, and I was happier than I don't know what. That just pleases me to no end. You don't know how much that pleases me. <laughs> You know, over the past year, we've had a lot of conversations on Twitter messages, a lot about food and recipes. We'll talk about this later because I just love when a message from you pops up because I know I'm going to have a great time and, and probably laugh a lot because you're incredibly funny. People don't realize how funny you are. Yeah, well, that's, that's just the way the recipes are going. I usually call you when my hair's on fire trying to get something done in the kitchen. And the pandemic has changed everything. So, huh? You were one of my best right. friends during the pandemic. And I learned <laughs> to cook a lot better thanks to you. Oh, great. We're going to talk about that at the end, about pandemic cooking and baking. This is more comfortable. Are those flowers from your own garden? Yes, from my garden at Kroger's. No, they're not from <laughs> my garden. No. You're so lucky to have that. It's been, you know, we've been in the 90s here. So a lot of the flowers are kind of cutting back the basil is going crazy though oh really you bet i mean just growing like crazy oh gosh and what do you make with it well pesto you know and Lots just of pesto. a cream pesto is the easiest way to do it i love the flavor of basil put it on a pizza mm. i have a friend who made basil sugar just sugar in a little robot or grinder with basil and the sugar is beautiful because it comes out a beautiful kind of transparent green and you could do that over oh gosh over mixed fruit cobbler something like that yeah well you know i'm thinking about putting some basil and some olive oil oh yeah and have that, absolutely uh, basil infused olive oil i think people are doing weird stuff with it now like basil ice cream but the classic always works. Okay, so there are a lot of things we want to talk about and a lot of questions I want to ask you. So ask just, away. Yeah, just tell me very briefly how you got into journalism, how and why you got into journalism. Oh, you know, when I think about it, I go all the way back to when I was eight, nine years old. My twin brother and I were living in Denver, and there was a little uh, community of Belgians and it was sort of Dutch. And so what we had was a whole area where they had a shoe shop and a bakery and things like that. Well, the shoe shop used to have little photographs from the United Press International that they put up. And my brother and I talked the shoe man into saving the photographs for us. All kinds of things like the first, you know, landing of a rover, not a rover, but the whole space program, getting to, you know, all these fantastic photos. And we loved it. So we started collecting that. I read the newspaper every single day 
day. But I still didn't aspire to be a journalist until I got to college and went to work for the college radio station. And that's when I really discovered it. Actually, I wanted to be a DJ because I had long hair and I was a rock and roller and I was sure that my tunes would sell. And so I said, I I'll be a, you know, a, a DJ. And they said, well, you're a junior and the only way you'll get there, if you work in the news department, we're going to let you then move you up the list to be a DJ. What was a trick? Jamie, a complete trick, because I got into the news department and I never got out. <laughs> so, I really well, loved it. And so I did radio and then I did got into television out in San Francisco. And then CNN was born and I joined CNN in the early going back in 1981. And uh, what a wild ride. What a wonderful ride. What a wonderful way to engage the world and see it. You have had an amazing career. There's probably not a lot of people who have seen as much of the world as you have. You know, it's a probably exclusive club of people who have been all the places you have in such varied, diverse locations. I mean, you've been in Iraq, Bosnia, Rwanda, and then Beirut, Frankfurt, London, Rome, and you've spent time in war zones, areas of famine, and then some pretty kind of, you know, rich cities, I mean, Rome and London. How did you move, I mean, psychologically, how did you move from one place to the next? I mean, if you spent a big block of time in a war zone and then you got sent to London, for example, or just moving from these incredibly diverse and different regions, how did you adapt to moving from one place to another with such well, drastic changes? Learn, Jamie, you have to learn how to do that. And, you know, I can remember some of my earliest trips down in Latin America covering the Falklands War, which we never saw it. I mean, we were in Buenos Aires, so we didn't see much of it. But it enabled me to travel to the tip of South America. And years later, the Gorbachev Reagan summit took me to Iceland. And, you know, it's allowed me to really go through all of the continents, with the exception perhaps of Australia, and really see it. One of the beauties of journalism is, and especially of CNN over the years, especially in the early years, is you decided what stories you were going to cover, you pitched them, and if they bought into it, you had a trip. And so, you know, it allowed you to go to all of these places and experience the people. And food, food was a huge part of it. I mean, my lasting memories of many places are the food. I mean, if you go to the tip of South America, say, Punta Arenas, Chile, you will never forget the crab soup there. I mean, you, you could eat buckets of it. It's just absolutely wonderful. And those are the kinds of things that you know, helped you to get through it. War zones, uh, a completely different situation, you know, and, and a lot of tragedies and famines. You know, there have been times when, as a CNN crew, I mean, we would close up our tents and pull out our food and eat it cold out of cans or whatever in the tent just because you had thousands of people surrounding you that were literally starving. And you couldn't feed them all. You couldn't feed them all. I remember when the Kurds escaped after the first Gulf War into Iran, every morning they would bury children. You know, I tried to take treats to other tents and in private give people uh, little bits of food, candy for the kids, whatever. But that's very difficult to do. And you have to be careful. It's not responsible to do that kind of a thing. But somehow you level it all out and the experiences begin to gel in your mind. Well, what it sounds like is that the food you were eating and the way you were eating it was pretty representative of the whole experience, kind of a microcosm oh, of it. Absolutely, and it, the foods represent the people, and it represents you know the farming communities, because you don't just travel to cities. It, well, if you want to be a journalist who sees and gets to know a country, you don't just travel to the cities where you're going to be treated to European-style foods. In many of the places you go, even in Africa, you go to rural areas where you're going to taste what they grow and what the subsistence farmers are living on. And they have learned to make fantastic dishes with that. And cassava and other things that you just wouldn't you know be eating if you were living in the western world these things are all coming your way were you lucky enough to be invited into local people's homes and have them cook oh, for you many many times many times and i mean up in the shoof mountains with a, her husband worked for me as a, a driver and my god we were up there and dining on uh, your typical lebanese meza which is huge but it was syrian dishes 
and you taste the difference between those dishes. I lived in Italy where, you know, the, the different flavors between Milano and going down to Sicily were completely different. And you learn that a lot of the chauvinism from one region to another, you know, is false. And what you find is every single region has something wonderful to offer. I had some tuna with uh, roasted peppers in a roasted pepper sauce in Sicily that I will never forget. I've tried and tried to match it, to recreate it. It's tough to do. I worked in a millinery studio in Milan, and one of the women gave me her recipe for rabbit in yellow peppers. Super simple dish. I'm going to send you the recipe, and it's really simple, and it's incredibly amazing. And it's something I never would have thought to try except for being there. Well, I certainly remember living in Rome. I had a favorite little osteria, and they had al sugo de lepre, which means just a rabbit sauce, a wild hare sauce on pappardelle. And oh my God, it was to die for. It was really rich and flavorful, and it spoke of the rural communities. Yeah, well, I know living in Europe living in both France and Italy, it's especially Italy, it's very peasant cooking. And even when you would go to Michelin star restaurants, it's still based on that peasant cooking. Whereas in France, the upper level aristocratic cooking is very different than peasant cooking. Whereas in Italy, it's all the same. Absolutely. It changes, you know, every which way that you go. And you find some really authentic dishes and you try to imitate those. You try to get the recipes. I know when I lived in Italy, we collected the recipes from some of the families of the people that we knew and combined them together and put them in a folder to go back. But there were other places where, you know, uh, my kids traveled with me. We had a restaurant uh, in Formello, just north of Rome, and it was called Vecchio Forno, the old oven. And uh, I remember they had a leopard, a real leopard. I should mention here that the actual owners and cooks were Egyptian. And they did a, uh, I got to remember the name of it, but uh, a, a version of what is it, What do you call that when we do the olives and the mushrooms, the tomatoes and basil? Bruschetta, that's it, bruschetta. And I mean, whoever heard of using uh, mayonnaise with, you know, grilled or sauteed uh, mushrooms oh, with tons of pepper? Terrific. And uh, using that as a bruschetta topping, I mean, it just disappears from the table. And everybody <laughs> loves it when I bring it up. When I make it here at home, everybody loves it. So was there ever a place that you were offered something local and traditional that freaked you out? Really weird, really scary? Well, I remember eating sea slugs. Uh, with a good <gasps> Chinese friend of mine. And, I mean, I eh, they're kind of flavorless, but I mean, <laughs> just the concept didn't appeal to me much. Um, the kind of they're being overfished now in the uh, Caribbean because the demand from China is so great. But, you know, also they had those meat restaurants, the bush meat restaurants, and everybody went to those when you were in Africa. There was a big one in Kenya, in Nairobi. And I never went because it didn't appeal to me to be eating giraffe or, or, you know, some other kind of exotic animal. It just, you know, that didn't appeal to me. Kind of turned me off on that stuff because there, there's plenty of choice in Africa. That's for sure. Did I ever tell you the time that I actually ate bush meat that we bought from people on the side of the road that they You're had You're a killed, brave soul. They especially. killed with a machete. <laughs> they killed with a rusty machete on a, on a cardboard table. And uh, we took it, it home It takes and some courage it. to eat stuff off it the street. It was pretty good. Especially if you're watching the guy all the time. During the siege of Tripoli, uh, when Arafat was holed up and he had the Syrians, the Libyans, the Israelis, Lebanese, and others fighting against him, there was a guy that sold these little pretzel-type things with cheese on them. And one morning I spotted him, and he spilled his whole cart right onto the filthy gutter of the street. And he took them all out, and he brushed them off. And I can't tell you, I ate so many of those previously. And that was kind of the end of my adventure with him as a street cook. So I always wonder what's going on. And if you've Well, ever... it's like the sea slugs. Maybe if you don't know anything about what you're eating or how it's prepared or what's happened to it before it got to your plate... It's better. I mean, it happens all around the world, I guess. It does. It does. And there's something to be said. It probably won't kill you. I don't believe that Chinese saying that it'll help you to live three days longer. But uh, <laughs> I, try to, I try to try everything within reason. 
<laughs> so tell me the story about the early days in Afghanistan. You know, we were chatting via Twitter about it. And I think that, you know, meals, when you're an international correspondent, it's one of the ways you anchor your life. And breakfast is one of the most important of all of them. And we all came down. This was only days after the fall of Kabul and the takeover. And uh, so they suddenly had satellite television. And I was meeting, we were, journalists were gathering in the breakfast room, all hungry, all waiting. And Christian Amanpour was there. Ashley Banfield showed up. All kinds of people we were sitting there waiting for breakfast. And we look over on the television screen. Now they're downloading satellite images. And what they had tuned to was a channel that ran loops of these ads for porn sites. And so it was a soft porn site with images, uh, you know, with 800 numbers on them or toll numbers on them that you would dial. And it was like a scene out of Cool Hand Luke, the, the scene where the buxom blonde is washing the car up against the glass with all the soap suds and everything. Well, the wait staff, all men to begin with, the wait staff was gathered around this television set, 20, 25 of them, eyes like doorknobs looking at this. And we thought it was funny, and we laughed until I just, you know, put up the proposition that if we don't turn off this television set, none of us are getting breakfast. And it, that's what we had to do, was unplug the TV. Otherwise, these guys were never coming away from it. Uh, they had never seen anything like it in their lives. And they weren't going to give it up. And they weren't going to serve us breakfast and interrupt that. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a response to that. There is no response to that except <laughs> hope breakfast was good when you finally got it. It was. So feel free to just throw in other stories as you remember them. I'm going to switch down to a little bit more more serious topic. You did a lot of coverage of global food and hunger issues. And that's, as a food podcast, I think it's really important that we discuss this. And you won the A.H. Borma Award. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. And you were yeah. working, I think you were working for the U.N. Food and Agriculture Organization when you got into reporting on the famine and hunger in Africa. Is that correct? Well, actually, the sequence is we're out on assignment almost anywhere, certainly in any conflict zone. But just in normal life experiences in Africa, you are going to confront hunger. You are going to confront people that are, are literally living on the edge. We've made a lot of progress with the Millennium Development Goals, but still there's about one in nine people worldwide that don't have enough to eat. That's roughly 800 million people around the world don't have enough to eat every day. Now, that's an issue. But then you go to a country like Somalia where it becomes critical. And, you know, you see people who are literally in Baidoa, the city of death as they called it uh, during the famine there. People would stagger to Baidoa because it was centrally located. And there was a 25-year-old woman, I remember, and the doctor saying, she's going to die. She's going to die. And she just hadn't eaten anything. And about three months later, I went back to find that she had battened up and w was going to survive. But children, children, Jamie, they never recover. If that child between infancy and, say, two, two and a half years old, doesn't get enough to eat, what's going to happen is they're going to become stunted. What do we mean by that? We mean stunted physically. They'll be shorter. We mean stunted intellectually. They'll have a lower IQ because they didn't get the proper nutrition. And they're also stunted emotionally as a result of all of that. They will never recover for their entire lives. One in four of the world's children and three children in four in developing countries face that problem of stunting. That's how I got into it and learning about it. And every time we went anywhere, you know, the World Food Program was there and I was able to learn about it. There's FAO that does all the research up at the top and they disperse the funds. WFP, the World Food Program, those are the people that actually distribute the aid. And then you have IFAD that tries to do longer term planning and support for subsistence farmers because they are a huge part of the population around the world where they're just making enough money, growing enough food to get by. Now, that doesn't mean having money for education. That doesn't mean mon having money for clothes. They have to grow extra food in order to sell it to do that. Hunger remains one of the biggest problems that we have. In Afghanistan, that's going to be the next problem, getting humanitarian aid in there. And as hard as these groups work to try to do it, there's always some thug standing in the way. Take Somalia, for example. It's important to understand, you know, when we say, well, we're going to send some humanitarian aid there. Well, in Somalia, and it's a perfect example, the warlords would take control of a port. 
So when the World Food Program comes in with a shipload of humanitarian aid, sacks of grain, et cetera, et cetera, the warlord then says, I want so much of that for myself. They're going to use it to sell it, buy more arms. They're going to use it to pay their troops. They're going to distribute it to their friends. And they have to do these negotiations to get humanitarian aid through. The thugs still control a lot of the world's food supply uh, in the, those kinds of manners. Not everywhere, of course, but sometimes in the developing world, it's much more prevalent. And it's a sad, I don't know, commentary on the human condition on the way that we are, that we would, you know, take food out of the mouths of the children over here so that we could favor our fighters over there. It's not encouraging, but, you know, those are issues that have to be covered and explain to people. I mean, explain to them how much waste is involved, how today, I mean, one of the major costs of humanitarian aid is actually shipping that aid. And so people, the UN agencies and others, try to purchase as locally as they can so they don't have to pay the huge transportation costs of food, which can sometimes match the cost of the food itself, or the food was donated. So you saw all this going on. I mean, how long were you seeing this happening before you decided that this had to become a series of, oh, I say, reportage? You know, that was throughout, throughout the time that I was posted overseas and sent to conflict zones. You know, food shortages in conflict zones are a given because the supply chain has been interrupted. In other places, droughts cause famines, water shortages. There's all kinds of problems that people can face, and they have to confront this, and food is the first thing to go. When it goes, people either have to move on, migrate to someplace else, or we have to bring in aid. So actually that age Burma Award was not for any specific story that I covered about hunger, but it was from the pattern of covering it, not for weeks or months, but literally, Jamie, for years. And that's why it's one of my you know, most prized possessions, a beautiful medal. And that's from the Food and Agriculture Organization that's based in Rome. And I became better friends with them, of course, when I lived there. And you know, they do the research on the types of food like quinoa or uh, cassava, what's going to grow well, what's resistant to disease, what is able to survive a drought. And those are critical, critical research issues that have to be addressed if we're going to solve the problem of world hunger. Okay, as someone, I'm not a journalist, I'm just a regular citizen who watches the news, who gets news from TV and internet, and it seems like back in the day, you know, in the 80s, 90s, we were seeing a lot about the famines, about food shortages, about hunger. In the last few years, I just feel like we're seeing it less, except in relationship to climate change. I feel like, first of all, everything that happened in the states in politics and then COVID has just kind of taken over the news. And then focused has switched to climate change. And I'm not saying it shouldn't, because obviously climate change is going to be devastating to the impact on hunger and famine that's already existed. It's just going to be devastating. But I mean, do you feel like as somebody who's so close to the topic that it's still being not only covered in the news as it should be and as as much as it used to be, but that all of these agencies are still trying to work on this problem as much as they were when it was much more of a visible problem. Well, certainly the news cycle demands stories. And to get the interest of the media, sadly, if you're an African, it's going to take thousands of deaths. I remember the U Uganda's prime minister said to me, Jim, I go to sleep at night watching CNN, and I pray to God you never mention Uganda. Because if you do, I know that it's going to be something so terrible, I'm not going to want to know about it. And that you know, we cover disasters. The news media covers disasters, and they go from one disaster from another. And that's that phenomenon you're talking about in the 80s and the 90s. There have been other disasters, 9-11 and all these other things that have come up, and they pushed other stories out of the news. But the hunger problem has actually improved. Uh, they've been forward storing uh, supplies in different places to respond more quickly and to respond better. They've learned a lot about hunger. They've been helping those subsistence farmers. There has been a lot of progress met, but you named it. I mean, <laughs> climate change, that's going to change just about everything for everyone. And you're going to see large migrations of people. You know, I don't know how long the Gulf uh, there all along the uh, 
the gulf between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and everything is going to remain inhabitable if global warming keeps up. It's already uninhabitable for about a month of the year, unless you're running your AC 24-7. It's just so hot there. We're going to see that change. And I think the Western world is getting a taste of what it's like to undergo one of these emergencies. And COVID was the case. When you have to lock down an entire country like Italy or France or the United States or states within the United States, people begin to see, wow, this is really an emergency. My life has been changed and we feel sorry for ourselves. Well, guess what? This is how the third world lives. They go from one calamity to another and they pray for rain sincerely because they know it will change their life and their livelihoods. It may even have to change their address. So people who live in richer countries are going to be behind the efforts for at least for climate change when it starts to affect them. Is there enough coverage of hunger in developed countries? And are we going to have to feel the impact of climate change on the loss of food resources in our wealthy countries before we, you know, worry about those people who are more impacted in a greater way in the developing countries? Well, the pattern is clear. And the pattern is that the West, whether it's the European Union or whether it's the United States or uh, other uh, industrialized countries, we really don't react until there's a huge crisis somewhere or a minor crisis at home. And uh, while the United States has vast farmlands, I mean, they're looking at the fact that almonds, almonds are wonderful. We love to use them in cooking. But almonds take a huge amount of water, and that water could be perhaps better used uh, on other crops. And crops could, should be developed that don't require lots of fertilizer and lots of added uh, nutrients so that the soil can recover, so that it can better weather a drought. All of these things we're going to have to come to grips with, but it's going to take time. And from my observations, it's not going to be automatic at all. Already, I travel to the Caribbean a bit, and I mean, they're worried about what's going to happen to some of their islands with rising sea levels. And they realize they have nothing to do with this. I mean, their CO2 emissions are, are minuscule, and yet the big countries are still pouring out CO2, and uh, it is impacting them. And they're asking now, they're demanding that they get the consideration and they get the kind of relief and help uh, that they need, because they say, it's your problem, and you're dumping it on us. How much we wake up? Jamie, that's a really tough question. I know a lot of people are trying to convince the world that it's got to wake up, and climate change is serious, it's real, and it's going to have to be addressed as if we want to get it done tomorrow rather than just once again kicking the can down the road. And I think it's like so many things where it's going to have to hit home. People just take their lives for granted and don't want to change things. I mean, I know for years, we've always only owned one car. We use it when we have to, and we walk and take public transportation when we can. And over the last 20 years, people have thought we were crazy because we only had one car. It's like, what? There's not, you know, one for everybody in the family. People just I, think that, it's no, insane. I remember a Chinese guy that I met, and uh, I spoke with him about climate change. And I said, you know, China has a big responsibility, and pollution is a huge problem in China, huge. You can't breathe in Beijing some days. It looks like a fog has enveloped the city. And... He said, oh, yeah, no, he says, I really understand. I really, we want to solve this problem. But he says, right after I get my car, I'll address that after I get what I want. And that's the attitude of, I think, a majority of people. Yeah, I'll do my part after I get what I want. And that's not going to be good enough. Or if it's not an inconvenience. And it works its way up to governments as well. Government wants to keep the people happy. You know, right, exactly. People are complaining. They'll say, okay, the oil companies, I mean, they're well taken care of. We're just coming to a realization here of what we've done to ourselves. Rather than develop technologies that were clean, we have gone ahead and allowed easy billionaires to take over campaign donations, take over the, the agenda, take over the priorities that nations should be setting, not just for themselves, but for the entire world and for the planet.
that we live on. Serious, serious issues. Absolutely. So backing up a little bit to the work you've done on famine and hunger, I know you support or have supported private initiatives like Soup for Syria. Can you tell us about some of the private initiatives people are doing that you've seen? I think, you know, GoFundMe has been a huge boost to various things from uh, getting aid to the Hopi Indian tribes here in the United States as they suffered disproportionately from COVID to helping out individuals in Africa or the Middle East. And you see, the reason that I like soup for Syria is it's a cookbook and it's telling you all these delicious soups, but you buy it and you're helping the refugees. There are just millions upon millions of refugees as a result of the conflict in Syria which was a result of the conflict in Iraq. And all of these different things come together. And sometimes it's only private individuals that can help. And I don't even mean private individuals like the former head of Blackwater that was telling people he would fly them out of Kabul, Afghanistan for $6,500 apiece. That's, that borders on criminal. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There are cases where individual small efforts, I can't remember the name of the cook, you know, the cook that goes around to different places and he, he starts cooking for people and serving yeah, thousands Jose Andres. upon thousands. Yeah, Jose you Andres. Know, meals a day. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, I mean, amazing. The World yeah. Kitchen. Exactly. Um, These initiatives, and, you know, yeah. they kind of shame us, huh? They, they make us think about it. And that's good. And they good. do it not only for nothing in return, but the only time they talk about it is to try and raise money to support them. They do it humbly. They do it as if it's just what one human being does for another human being when they have the resources themselves to do it. I mean, what they did in Puerto Rico, they're in Haiti now, yeah? It's incredible. And I guess the easiest way to find these things is just to, well, hang out on social media or to Google initiatives that you can support that are organizations, individuals that are trying to help people elsewhere in the world. I know you're focused more on out in the world, but there's got to be initiatives like this in the States. There are. There have long been soup kitchens in the United States, food banks in the United States. And those really came to the fore during the COVID crisis as people couldn't go to work. They had no means of support. Even if the government put a stay on their eviction, that stay is going to be lifted. And where do they come up with the money? How do they recover from so many months out of work? And cynically, some people said, well, they're not going back to work because, you know, they make more money sitting at home. I don't really believe that that's largely true. It may be true in some cases. There may be some anecdotal evidence of that. But I think for the most part, people want to work. They want to support their families. They want their families to thrive and succeed, not just to survive. Yeah. I mean, I know that we were lucky enough in France where the government was giving everyone unemployment, I mean, permanent unemployment. For example, we promised not to fire anyone when we had no clients and no work if our employees didn't come into work because we sent them home because, you know, we weren't making an income to pay them their salary and there was no work for them to do anyway. So the government has been picking up the tab and paying them unemployment. And and during this whole pandemic, you know, I know you did a real service to everybody in terms of writing that cookbook, Isolation Baking, and asking us, what what do you want me to cook? Those kinds of things. And it was a godsend. No, we only lost one employee the whole time, and it was because she was tired of sitting at home and not working. So she quit the hotel to let go and help people in their homes who needed help, uh, the elderly, things like that. But for the rest of our employees, they were all itching. They kept sending us messages or popping by saying, when can we come back to work? We're dying to come back to work. We're tired of sitting at home and doing nothing but gardening and homeschooling. Well, my son, Sean, who uh, helps to manage a venue downtown, you know, they've used this uh, latest surge in order to pause and do a lot of rebuilding. So he's just waiting till they tap him to go back in. And, you know, so a lot of people are in different situations. And God forbid, Jamie, if we get another wave of something even worse than this Delta variant. And a lot of people are worried about that because we don't know how it's going to morph. We don't know how it's going to mutate. So a little bit more on the personal side, Jim, because as somebody who's raised multicultural children myself and lived in various countries, your wife is Chinese. You're American. I know you've lived in 
a lot of different countries, and I'm assuming since you've been married and had kids, you've lived in different countries. You're raising kids with two very different cultures, much more different than mine as an American Jew with a French Catholic husband. How did you navigate the different cultures with your kids and primarily with the food? It's two very food cultures, which, as we both know, it's not only the dishes you cook, but it's who cooks, how you cook, how you serve it. Well, you know, you're absolutely right celebrations. And I'm wondering if, like we did, if you ever used food kind of as teaching tools for them to understand the different cultures that make up who they are. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because it's a topic that just fascinates me. It's a me. fascinating subject, Jamie. I mean, when you have a multicultural family, my wife was born in Hong Kong, moved to New York as, you know, a very young child. And that's where we met was in New York. But she's Chinese. I'm Irish American Catholic. And so, you know, there's <laughs> there's a difference. But it's like most marriages, as you well know, if you want to be happy, uh, make mama happy. So, you know, if she wants <laughs> to if she wants to cook Chinese food, I'm not going to try because I know what's going to happen when I try to serve up the dish. At the same time, I learned Italian cooking quite a bit when we lived in Italy. When we lived in Britain, she did most of the cooking. And yet it has a pretty good Chinatown there where we could find good food, the good ingredients to make those things. And sure, I mean, the children, I have two daughters and a son, and the children have learned how to cook as well. And they have their favorite dishes. Uh, we traveled together, did a safari. When they got older, we went to uh, Africa and did a safari. And so they got to sample some of that, you know, adventure. But we also took them to places like the pyramids in, in Egypt. And they had a tutor that taught them how to read hieroglyphics. They don't remember it, but it taught them a lot about it. And they certainly remember London. And so my youngest daughter was born right when I returned home here to Atlanta. But she, too, has traveled with us around the world and enjoyed a lot of the benefits that being a traveling correspondent you have. It's a learning, teaching experience. And the foods come with us. All of our favorites, like the bruschettas and uh, the things from Italy. And I've been teaching them a little bit about French dishes, and they like it. I made beignets, I think that's how you pronounce it, the other day, and it was a huge hit with shrimp and corn. So every place has something to offer, just like every person has something to offer. There haven't been religious conflicts in our household because people in our household, you understand there's right and wrong, there's good and evil, and there are standards that you have to uphold to recognize people's rights. So do you guys fuse your food cultures or do you keep them very distinct and separate? Oh, I, it's mostly kept distinct because if I decide I'm going to cook Italian tonight, I'll try to do up the entire Italian meal. If she's going to cook something Chinese, and her father was a fabulous cook who taught me a couple of secrets. I'll tell you about that in a second. But, you know, we try to keep, you're on one theme. You don't try to mix the themes as you're uh, putting together meals. It, it stirs memories in everybody's minds about the places that they've traveled, the places that they've been, the friends that we have. And we still have friendships in all of those places. Gonna... Now, I'm so glad you said that because that's what we did with food. We make something that Nona Anna made, our neighbor who we called Nona Anna, like she was adopted grandparents of our kids in Italy. And it's like Nona Anna made this. Do you remember? And do you remember being with Anna and Pepe in, in their house in the country? So, yeah, Absolutely. So it's something that we can share together, enjoy together. And uh, my son has gotten into Indian cooking. I don't know why, but uh, he's gotten quite good at it. And in fact, he's got some stuff in the refrigerator marinating that I think we're going to try tonight. Uh, nice. So, you know, <laughs> they see food as a bit of adventure. And I guess they've learned that from us. They see good. it as a way of traveling around the world. And I think there's something true about that. You know, share a culture, eat a dish. That is an excellent motto. I'm going to have t-shirts made. So your pandemic year, you cooked a lot. Did you cook more than you usually cook? Did you cook different things than you usually cook? Were you more adventurous? I know you made a lot of desserts, which your family is not very sweet oriented. So I think they started to resent me a little bit for <laughs> giving you all these recipes. But Well, one of the biggest ways that I think things changed up, I decided to try sous vide cooking. And right. uh, one of the things that I learned about it, it's fabulous. If you want to do steaks, that is far and away the best way to do a steak. 
and you can take that cheap cut of meat, uh, you know, a chuck roast, and you find it on sale, and all you have to do is cook it at 130.5 or 131.5 Fahrenheit for 29 hours, and it'll come out tasting wow. like filet mignon. I mean, it's just fabulous. But as my daughter reminded me, she just said, you know what, you're cooking way too much red meat. And so she's got me down to where once a month I can do my steak extravaganza. And I'll sneak in a, a steak or two different cuts uh, at other times. But I'm still experimenting with sous vide. And I'm experimenting with uh, lots of French cooking, with Orange Appeal, your recipe book, uh, which I love because of the fresh fruit uh, that you can bring into a regular meal. And, you know, one of the ones that I like, you build one as a salad with oranges and other green oh. in ingredients. And then you have one that's kind of a dessert that you sprinkle sugar over. And still, you know, you can moderate how much sugar you're putting into things and you're still getting those fresh fruits. And then I should probably do a whole course on vegetable cooking and how to do that. I've certainly learned how to do uh, ribs in a different way with uh, pomegranate sauce and a lot of cilantro and things like that. So I've cooked with foods I've never cooked with before. I've done dishes I've never done before. And it was something to do when we're all locked down. It, it was some way to have a little bit of an adventure. And if you will, go somewhere. Go somewhere around the world and taste the oh, flavors definitely. of those places. I'm lucky to have an international market where I can find some of the really rare items and enjoy those and learn how to cook them properly. You've been a huge help with that, Jamie. A huge help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I know sometimes it's, here, Jim, try this. <laughs> and you do. You're so a game. And we share pictures. And although I'm still waiting for a picture of a cobbler where you've actually gotten your cobbles at the top to look like cobbles, because the first time you did it, I think they were a little bit spread out. But you just had a disaster with a peach cobbler. Yeah, so. I made double the batter this time, so I didn't have that problem. Uh, what I had the problem with this time was it bubbled over into the stove. I had so many peaches. It's peach picking time in Georgia, you know, Jamie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I did give you a savory recipe, chicken with peaches, which is very yummy, that you paired with your wife's rice. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I leave the rice making. She puts her finger into the dish with the rice in it and can tell by which knuckle it goes up to how to get the water right. And then she just puts it on there. It boils. She puts the lid on it, takes it off, and the rice is perfectly cooked. It's oh. not burned onto the bottom. I am so jealous of the way that she does I want that. A, I want a tutorial. She should do a YouTube tutorial on that. <laughs> She'd have the millions of viewers. So I have all my questions answered. This was a fascinating, fascinating time. I loved cooking with you, baking with you, and I hope we get to do it again. Oh, we will. I'll have some problem. I'll come running to you. <laughs> and I have to be mindful of, of the time that it is because we've got six hours difference between us. You're there in Chinon, France, and we're here in Atlanta, Georgia. Yep. But from around the world, food brings people together. Does. And it does. Uh, I think we'd go stir crazy if we, <laughs> if we didn't have others to rely on and recipes to share and little changes that we make. Absolutely. And now everyone knows why I love Jim Clancy. There you go. So I will wrap it up and say thank you so much. This was an amazing, amazing hour. Yeah, it's been an hour and great fun and fascinating. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Thanks and for having us, Jamie. See you soon. See you very soon on Twitter. There you go. Thank you.